I am so honored to have you guys here today. You know, welcome, welcome to the uh, the new podcast in this new room. You know, I decked out a brand new room. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to Sigma Cast. This is uh, Billy Facilli here, and um, we've now created a, a space where four people can have a you know an interesting conversation, all hooked up, everything done professionally. You know, I'm, I'm proud of this 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 thing. We're Thank proud you. of you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> this is an awesome setup. Thanks, guys. Thank you. It's nice um, to be here. Yeah, today the topic's going to be uh, fatherhood, something that is, uh, you know, very inspiring. Um, I, I believe I'm like a aspiring father. You know, I love to listen to you guys talk about fatherhood and talk about your trials and tribulations and, you know, the struggles and the beautiful moments too, you know. Um, yeah, it's uh, sounds like a wild journey and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely excited to take that on one day. For sure. Yeah. You'll be amazing, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Y- you reckon? I reckon yeah, yeah, I reckon. Yes. You're doing the work, like you're doing the inner, in, in, the inner work, which is the most important work. And I feel that just leads you to become like a great father because you're just like becoming open the space and open your capacity to like bring in all this love and compassion. And that's yeah. what you need to be able to nurture like a little human. So the more you can get rid of like the stuff that doesn't serve you, you can yep. bring in all the good stuff that allow you to be a, like an amazing father. So, I mean, you know, love and compassion. Proud of your journey. Oh, thanks, brother. Really appreciate that. I man. agree. That's really well said. Yeah, very much so. And I guess it's important to to remain cognizant that you know you can hear what other people have to say and hear about other people's journey, but know that yours is going to be unique to to yourself. There are no two journeys in fatherhood or parenthood in general that are the same as anyone else's. Mm. It's important to remember that. Every path is different. Absolutely. Yeah. I've noticed that. that. Thanks for voicing it. That's Mm. great. Now we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to break it up into five segments. All right. So the first segment is going to be called, is, is becoming a father. The second segment is early years and parenting styles. The third segment is balancing fatherhood and life. The fourth is lessons learned. And the fifth is future hopes and dreams. So um, I'd like to get started on segment one because I feel like this could be a very long podcast and we could go for hours and hours. Um, But we'll try to keep it, we'll try to keep it wrapped up so um, we can just give everyone you know just a good amount of you know inspiration information and um you know not go on for too long because we could we could talk about this for four hours it's crazy um becoming a father it's a big thing it's huge huge. um let's take a few minutes to talk about you know the personal stories of you guys becoming a father because i think that's a you know, like you like you mentioned before, it's all it's all um, different. Yeah. It's all it's all absolutely. Yeah. Um, Josh, you wanna Josh, you wanna go first? We'll go we'll go in that order. Sure. So, uh, my wife and I have been together for probably ten years, nine or ten years now, and we've got a four-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy almost four-year-old girl. And with regards to becoming a dad, I was pretty relaxed about it. Like I was more focused on my wife. I just said, whatever you want, it's good by me. Uh, but like that wasn't necessarily a good thing. She wanted me to be a bit more motivated about becoming a dad or she would have liked that. Um, but, you know, I was more focused on her for whatever reason. And that's so she decided she wanted to have kids one day. I said, great, let's do that. And in brief... Our first child was all really healthy in when she was in utero and then a month before she was due, uh, she stopped moving. And so Corinne, my wife, who's really cognizant of what's good, what's not good, I was like, ah, it's probably okay, like just relax and I'm sure it'll all work out fine. And it turns out that it wouldn't have. So it was good that Corinne went to hospital and that's supposedly what everyone should do oh, wow. if baby stops moving um, for an uh, unusual amount of time and so we had her by emergency cesarean a month early and she wasn't moving or anything in Corinne's tummy Uh, but then as soon as she came out she was yelling which was good news 
So <laughs> that was nice. Um, it was kind of cool when she was born and they put her in a uh, humidity crib and they put blue light on her, I think, to get rid of the jaundice. I don't know exactly, but I'm pretty blue sure light. that's what it was. Yeah. And they put these like this, uh, like <clears throat> essentially a blindfold, mm -hmm. but the blindfold <laughs> had glasses on it. So I got this photo of her with these... Groovy fake, guys. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was funny at the time. Uh, and then, yeah, two years later, we had our son, Luca, who uh, was born completely naturally. I was mentioning it to Anth earlier. So Sage was born via cese emergency cesarean, completely unnaturally. And Luca was born because it was so... Because they didn't believe my wife when she said, like, it's pretty painful... They thought, I think she was complaining, but she's got a high pain tolerance. So it turns out she was already giving birth when they thought that she was just complaining. Oh, so wow. they're like, oh, it's too late to have any kind of drugs or anything. You just have to give birth naturally. And which she was happy with in the end. And it's pretty impressive, but mm -hmm. um, completely natural and completely unnatural. And it was, um, yeah, I was much more relaxed. I was funnily enough, much more relaxed with... Sage, even though I was worried about her having brain damage and these sorts of things going through my mind at the time, um, I was much more relaxed uh, in that environment because we didn't have to go through the birthing process. With Luca's birth, it was everything was going really well, but I was just like, I think shocked, a little bit shocked at yeah. the process. And um, yeah, I couldn't even spell my wife's name when they asked me how to spell her first name. <laughs> I couldn't even spell it. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> that's just how it was. And yes... I think that's a good way to summarize yeah. how I became a dad. It's really amazing. Cool. Thank you for sharing. And I totally empathize with those feelings that you would have in both of those situations. Um, with my eldest, uh, Kingston was also uh, born via a C-section, emergency C-section. Um, and it's a nerve wracking experience. Uh, with with Kingston in particular, um, he was, I think he was about a week late, uh, so he was full term, but uh, we were hoping to go have a natural uh, birth, but basically uh, his mother hadn't dilated far enough, and they've said, it's going to have to be an emergency C-section. You're welcome to be in the room for the entire process, because it'll just be a local anaesthetic. Yep. Uh, basically what was happening is that they were giving her the anesthesia, but she could still, even though it was numbing the general area, she could still feel the exact spot that they were going to make the incision. So they had to keep dosing her up until eventually she couldn't feel anything below her chin, except for that one spot. Well, so at this point they've said, well, actually it's going to have to be a general anesthesia now and you can't be in the room because whatever reason, maybe people don't really... Uh, do well seeing their partner unconscious during the whole process, and so you have to wait outside. So I'm waiting outside, and suddenly I hear, Code Blue, Level 3, Fuck. Room 2. That's not what you want to hear. Absolutely not. And I know what level of the building I'm on, and yeah. I know it's probably the second room down that hallway that we were in, the birthing suite, and this team of about 15 medical professionals comes running down the hallway, Fuck. except for one of them who's just casually, well, not casually, just really with purpose, walking calmly straight towards me while the others run in the room. And they basically just explain, look, we have taken him out, but the uh, umbilical cord is wrapped around his neck and he's not breathing. And they say in, I guess, the most confidence-inspiring way that they're doing everything that they can. However, there is a good chance that he will never breathe. Um, he will never take his first breath, and you might not have him. Now, after that, that doctor went into the room to join the others, and I was probably only out there for about five to ten minutes, but it felt like about four or five hours. Time stood still. Um, and I'm not a religious person, but I was really looking for someone to just pray to at that moment that this was... All of course, yeah. Work out. And thankfully it did. Um, so it was a pretty harrowing introduction to parenthood in that moment, but makes you feel such gratitude to have him there safely. Yeah. Um, at the time, I don't think I really um, appreciated how it would have affected his mother because being that she had had the general anesthesia, uh, once he was born, they took him to, you know, the um, 
incubation area, which was on a different floor. But because of the anesthesia, she wasn't allowed to move. So she would have woken up with a child suddenly no longer inside of her, not knowing where he is or if he's okay, other than the nurse's midwife's telling her so. So it was a pretty, it would have been a much more harrowing experience for her than it was for oh, me. Of course, of course. Uh, second time around, so we, so with my youngest, Zeon, we also had a natural birth for him the second time around. However, basically his mother's water broke about three months early. And so from that point on, because of the heightened risk of infection, you have to stay in hospital. There is a chance that she may go full term. Realistically, the baby will probably arrive within 48 hours to a week, which he did. So he came at 28 weeks. So he was tiny. Like Jeez. you could fit him in the palm of your hand with his legs dangling there. He was, he was nothing. He weighed like a kilo. Whereas his brother was three in a bit, 3.3, I think. Um, and again, same thing, uh, similar thing. Yep. Uh, you know, the doctors will give you as much um, reassurance uh, that they possibly can that, you know, you're in the best place for this to happen and they'll do everything that they can and they've got the best equipment in the Western world to make this, to accommodate this situation. But realistically, at 28 weeks, there's a good chance that he won't be here next week. So in the nicest possible way, they just kind of manage your expectations and say, don't get too attached just yet. Every day that he's here, every week that he's here, the you know the likelihood of him being here the next week increases. Yep. But at this point... To parents' yeah. worst nightmare. Absolutely. And it's right at the start. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, we were fortunate that, you know, uh, that aside, he was, you know, <clears throat> perfectly healthy. And they tell you that, you know, by the time he reached... Obviously, it's a case-by-case, case and it depends on the individual. Yep. But by the time they reach two years old, they will pretty much catch up to where they would have been otherwise. But for that first couple of months it was pretty harrowing and also he had to stay in hospital until his original due date so it was a good two and a half three months of you know going to the hospital every day oh. uh, across town until they moved him closer um, and it, yeah it's I couldn't it imagine how that would, an experience I couldn't imagine how that would you know take an impact on you at that present moment when you're going through mm. those months <clears throat> I had a friend that went through that quite recently my mate, my mate Chris Similar experience happened to him, you know. Like yeah. 28, 30 weeks. Yeah. And, um, it's wild. It is. Yeah. Just happy to hear that, you know, we've got a good medical system and they, they're able to look after the kids. Absolutely. Very well. Yeah. Yeah, both those stories, like if I compare those to the two births that I've been part of, it's my wife. It just seemed pretty traumatic. Like, <laughs> like in terms of your mental health and stuff post, do, especially does. you, Matt, and then... Yeah for your first as well like that, how, how that impact you emotionally and have you processed any of this because uh, there's i think the stats are out there like men don't really process the birth but they feel the emotional impact of it later on in life do you feel like it's played a, a role in a part of, like an emotional impact in your life in hindsight i think it probably did um i probably didn't really recognize it at the time okay. uh, so i don't know that i necessarily processed it emotionally um as to the best, uh, as much as I should have, mm. perhaps. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that there is definitely um, elements of that uh, experience that have affected me in ways since then, um, whether it's with my relationship with their mother or with my relationship with them. Yeah, interesting. What about you, Josh? Uh, yeah, I think what you said, Anth, is validated by my experience, whereby I really struggled to be the dad that I wanted to be up until my son was born. And weirdly enough, him going through, maybe, maybe I've never thought about it, but maybe him going through a natural birth kind of helped with that because mm. essentially the time that he arrived was when I started to make progress to become the kind of dad that I would have preferred to be in the first place, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe you're right on. Maybe it's worth considering that if anyone was to give birth unnaturally, the psychological impact. Mm. Definitely. Definitely something there. You know, like traumatic experience going through what, what you did with Z. 
Yeah, I mean, both. It's it's funny because I was speaking to Anthony about this before because he he asked what you know how you process the emotion of that situation with with Zeon. But I guess because I had a similar thing, albeit entirely different, with Kingston the first time around, I think it perhaps negated the severity of of how um, traumatic the you know having having a a child born at 28 weeks. Desensitized. Yeah, sort of, yeah I think I was very much desensitized yeah, to, yeah, to the emotional true. side because I'd already had that, albeit a hell of a lot shorter, experience of, all right, don't get too attached just mm. yet. Try mm. to... I mean, obviously, you're going to feel these emotions and worst case scenario, it's going to be a very traumatic experience and my heart goes out to anybody that, that has gone through that and lost their child at, at birth or during birth or shortly after birth because yeah. it would have been so rough. Uh, yeah, an absolutely so horrific rough. experience, yeah. especially to go through, you know, a good nine months of developing this emotional attachment to someone who's not yet arrived only to have that be, you know, so cruelly in some way taken away from you yeah. by, you know, circumstance. It's tough. Mm. And what are your um, experiences in the fatherhood realm when you came into it? Yeah, it was um, it was pretty epic. I guess it's like my first was a COVID baby, so June twenty twenty, um, and leading up to it, like we're having a hospital birth, and we sort of like sort of spoke about having a home birth, but we thought uh, for one home births you have to get private midwives, and they're sort of they're expensive. You're going to like five grand or something. And you get a, you get a free hospital, free hospital birth, so like it's you, you way up. But then once we went through the hospital system, and we sort of before that we had like a hospital tour, probably I don't know three months um, into the pregnancy, and we had like some sort of already like birth birth like a plan of preferences around what we wanted. We wanted like a, a water birth. We wanted to set up the space the way we wanted. We wanted the music, the lighting. We wanted to have a doula, like a birth doula. If you're not yeah, sure if you yeah, know, guys you know told me about the doula. Yeah. So an emotional sort of support. Um, that is pretty much uh, just someone who's so experienced in birth has been around birth a lot and just have that someone who's experienced to nurture you through the process and make you feel safe and just answer the questions and also um, have a voice it's like sort of your voice in, in situations especially in the hospital system you probably need a voice from someone who's more experienced so we had obviously we had a doula um, and then you know, when, uh, going through the the actual tour, we, I was asking questions about can we have a like a water birth because there's water birth facilities there, and she's like only if like there's a, a midwife that can sort of cater for that. So you're saying like potentially we can't have a water birth. She's like yeah, you put, maybe you can't like depending on the midwife at the time and because there's a lot of shift changes and stuff and just based on those conversations, like oh this is this is not the birth that we want. So we're sort of we're sort of going in like a bit like oh is hospital birth the right thing for us? And then COVID hitting like M March 2020. And then all the restrictions in hospitals changed. So like I couldn't be there for how long I wanted. We couldn't have the doula there, which was like one of the most important support, core, care, core yeah, care person that we wanted there, especially for a first first time like birth. Or I feel like it's yeah, really important to have a doula there because they've got all the information that you need and you're not doing it on your own. 100%. And so that so we had like a conversation like straight away. The hospital, I think the hospital called us and said, this is changing, so not sure what you want to do. And we're like, maybe we should have a home birth. And like, we're pretty like, well, home birth is big. It's a big decision to have a home birth, especially like no one around us has ever had a home birth before. Um, we're probably like one of the first about all our friends and family to do it. And so we just sort of like researched about home birth. And I said, cause there's like, there's like risk with home birth. Cause all these like bias sort of, I guess, comments around home birth. It's not safe and stuff. And like, mm. let's, let's look into this and see if that's true because, um, we want to find out like if it, if, it, if it's safe or not. And it's so safe. Like we listen to so many podcasts, actually called so many mid, like private midwives who do home births and um, they just reassured us how safe it is. Um, and based on like the birth, the birth plan or birth preferences that we had, like it's going to allow us to do all of that. Like yeah. we can have a home, we have a, like a, we can have a, a water birth. We can have like all the, the setup in the environment that we want. It's in our own home. Like, we have the same two midwives all, all the way through, so there's no chopping and change of midwives. Looking after like all the variables. Pretty much. So I was ticking all the boxes for us, like, yeah, let's yep. do this. Um, and then when we um, – and the good thing was like we moved a year before and the, the community that we created um, when we moved, like all, all, the, all the, the women were birthing at the same time and they're all having home births as well. So we're like 
Amazing. So it's like everyone's sort of sort of doing it, and a, a couple of them, um, I guess, the women had already had two home births, so um, like we already had some information and we had some like knowledge of how it went. So for us, like having a home birth was one of the sort of the best decisions we've ever made. Um, in terms of being able to like feel empowered to make that decision for one, but also like have have the birth that you want, and through that, like yeah, the pregnancy was was like it's hard for me to say as compared to these two guys' journeys, but like yeah. it was it was beautiful. It was, it was like it was natural. It was no complications. Yeah, my wife had like a, a natural birth with no intervention, like no drugs, because you can't have drugs anyway. There's no like serious drugs. You can't have an epidural at a home birth. Like no. there, the emphasis is natural. Got to be at the hospital to have Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and like there's a, a higher rate of natural birth through home birth as well. Um, so yeah, she had like sort of the perfect birth for her first birth. Um, and yeah, and I, fe- and I was involved so much. Like I got, I got involved straight away. Like I was working from home at that point as well yep. from March onwards. And I've been home for past you know, three years as well. So I've been a staying home dad pretty much, but obviously working still. But I hadn't been able to go. I what wasn't like moving in and out of the house. I wasn't going to work. I wasn't coming back. I was just so present all the time where possible. So yeah, the journey for me. I think the timing of all of it was just perfect, and I'm so grateful for how how it all panned out. Man, it's so cool. It's 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 such a it's such a a nice and natural and it's like going back to your roots, going mm. back to the ancestral ways of how they would give birth. Yeah. Instead of being in this, you know, in new civilization and like just throwing drugs at you to sedate you you know not not being conscious in that experience like it creates yeah, a lot of it's trauma like, this is like hospitals. The, it's like women have been doing this for years yeah, like yeah hundreds of years like thousands of years like birthing naturally at, a, at like at home or so like if for me i feel like this is like it's sort of shifted a bit and you know and i think katie wanted to get back there so the home birth for us was like the, w- the way to go. Yeah, definitely. You know, like seeing Luna running around and just being such a vibrant ball of energy. Like, you know, you guys did a wonderful job bringing her into the world. She's such a little funny kid, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure like, yeah, the birth experience for like the kids also plays a part in like their development as well. Oh, for sure. I reckon. Um, so, you know, we'll see. <laughs> We can compare in 10, 15 years yeah. how, how it went. Can I also acknowledge that I really admire how much thought you put into it? Mm. Like you were yeah. really conscious of the lead up mm. and I admire that you yeah. know, with you, what you explained there. I think that's fantastic. Because mm. I was not, I was uh, yeah, very, like I was trusting, there's nothing wrong with trusting, but like being aware and, and, and like enthusiastic as a dad, I think is, probably challenging i don't know what you think matt but i was not necessarily enthusiastic about the choices like i was enthusiastic about having a kid i was enthusiastic about my wife but i wasn't enthusiastic about the choices and i know my wife would have loved that so mm. yeah, yeah, respect for I, that i think i was much the same i don't think i i mean i was just along for the ride i suppose uh especially yeah. first time around um i mean first time around uh their mother was it, it was very much a conscious decision to have a child um i hadn't wanted to for you know a year or two prior to that just because i didn't think that i was ready and i think a lot of men uh, or a lot of people in general often get weighed down with the i'm not ready but i don't mm. i think in reality i don't think anyone is ever ready 100%. doesn't yeah. matter how ready you think you are you're, you're never probably yeah. not uh because you know one thing that i've always thought about um the the whole becoming a parent it's like you remember you know the the original matrix movie from like 1999 and yep. the tagline for that you know i remember when the ads came out and you saw the previews and you had um you know uh morpheus with the, the line you know nobody can t- be told what the matrix is you have to experience it for yourself mm. and i always thought parenthood like that like it doesn't matter how many stories you have from your friends that have got, you know, whatever um, combination of children that they have or whatever experience they've had. It's great to have people that have gone through it and can tell you what you know to expect, look out for. But the reality is, until you actually experience that, you've got no idea what it would be like. I've never been to war, and I hope that I never do. And people that have experienced that could explain to me what it is like. But unless you're actually in the middle of a war zone, I don't think you could actually. Mm really appreciate for lack of a better word what that scenario is actually like and i feel like parenthood 
I can't believe I kind of maybe just compared. He's a war zone. Parent- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> war. Because uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. And, and no disrespect to anyone that has actually oh, found I can, himself uh, in a war zone or had to go to war to fight. But yeah. Maybe we should edit that it's, one out. No, 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 no. no. That's, that's, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a, like, it's not, I like how you were conscious. Thank you for your service. Good analogy. Conscious of people who go to war, but just to make a funny kind of comparison and acknowledge that the comparison in a funny way is true. Yeah. Like my daughter who's four has called me evil a few times. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. but it's, it can feel like that as somebody who hasn't been to war, <laughs> for sure. I it relate. Str- it can be a struggle. Yeah. No doubt. Mm. When you said Warzone, like I was resonating. I'm like, is this is this, is this what it's going to be like? <laughs> um, the uh, house is looks like a Warzone. Not, it, at times. That's yeah, what I was picturing. Like Toys everywhere, zone. diabolical. And walking on eggshells. It's like walking through a minefield sometimes, mm. knowing what's going to trigger someone and how to get yep. how to get from here to there without some sort of explosion from one of these children mm. or myself or their mother or whatever it may be. Yeah. It it really is learning how to navigate through this as best as possible mm. with that leads us to the next step oh, uh, the next segment as well the early years and parenting styles mm. um let's explore the early years of parenting from newborns to toddlers and your experiences regarding that um josh we can start with you again okay so parenting styles i'm just going to use like my own take on parenting styles of course um so this is not based upon any kind of framework that's out there my wife is a lot like my dad i love my dad a lot and he's very different to me i'm a lot more like my mum. my mum was a great mum, but she was pretty ruthless and i would have thought that i would like to be like my dad my dad i would say is, was gentle and nurturing whereas my mum was loving and ruthless and so going into it, I thought, yeah, you know, I would prefer to be like my dad. Not that I gave it much thought. And then Sage came along, my daughter, my first. And I was definitely loving but ruthless. Fortunately, my wife, who's, again, a lot more like, like my dad in personality, is was, you know, gentle and nurturing. So it worked well. I was able to be like the disciplinary kind of person, which was necessary for her because she, Sage, is a lot like me. Um, she's pretty intense (laughs) and, um, yeah, that's, that's, that was my take on parenting styles. Definitely not the dad that I wanted to be when Sage was born, but I went into it unconsciously. So it makes sense that I got what I got. Mm. Yeah, totally. And it was only through accepting the fact that this is the way that I am, that I could see the ways in which I could move forward and become more you know, more like my dad. I'm never going to be like my dad uh, exactly because we're so different. But, you know, the more I can be like him, the more gentle and nurturing I can be, I think the better I'll be as a father. Mm. Your dad is a good man. He's a very good man. Um, do you have any a- anecdotes and memorable moments that you could, um, you could you could talk about, you know, the challenges that you faced during this stage of... Um, of the kids? Yeah. Uh, so, the terrible twos, this is something I've been talking about a fair bit mm. recently. My son has just turned two. He's like um, two, two years and one month old now, roughly. Uh, and my daughter is almost four. So, she's like three and, a, three and three quarters. My son went into the terrible twos at one year and three quarters, right? He changed, <laughs> he changed from being uh, compliant and enthusiastic yep. to being non-compliant and not enthusiastic, grumpy all the time. Changed like that on a day, I've forgotten wow. the day, or a week. It was very quick and it was unexpected. He was definitely a golden child, like really a golden child, amazing kid. Yep. And for four months, he was grumpy and he was non-compliant. Now he's enthusiastic again. Four months later, he changed on a dime again without any... Wow deliberate anything just it just happened and like he's really his personality is great again like in terms of i really uh, appreciate him a lot more because of his enthusiasm he's still non-compliant but i can deal with that and i expect him to be non-compliant for another year and a half because my daughter 
she came out of it at three and a half. Oh, okay. And she changed again in a day or a week. It was a short amount of time. And she suddenly became much more compliant. And I'm finding she's not the golden child, right? <laughs> Comparatively <laughs> in terms of personality and just... Yeah. <laughs> she's a lot more like me. Yeah. Um, but she she's just unbelievably uh, helpful. I never thought that she would be this helpful. And kind and considerate this is something that i consistently highlighted verbally to her throughout her terrible twos which was like almost two years worth um and she's come out and she's really kind and considerate on the whole and she's really great with her brother and i'm just like wow so so good man there's hope if anyone's going through that and my time like the yeah, one one and three quarters roughly. I've forgotten when my my daughter went into it. To three and a half is when she came out of it almost exactly. Just is intense in terms of that warlike experience, right? <laughs> it's intense, but there's hope for sure. We were cracking tantrums and just losing the plot, getting angry, starting to cry. Can't change nappies without them touching their the poo. Like this just I found that really challenging. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then three and a half, unbelievably helpful. Like, understands like most everything. Wow, and and is is helpful with regards to mostly everything. So, yeah. I'm sure you see. You know, you you have a deep appreciation after that. You know, after they exit that, and then they're more helping because it makes your job easier too. You know, so no, you must be wrapped. The, the terrible twos is over for. One of them. Get ready for three nages, man. Because that's... Once they get out of the terrible twos... You know, like, I, I, I found you. the same sort of thing. Like, mm. and, and again, one of the... One of the things, I guess, you, you sort of go through with the early stages, whether it's, you know, that first year... One of, the, one of my big takeaways from that first six to eight months in particular of the first year is... You really, you really come to understand why they use sleep deprivation as a form of torture, <laughs> because it's the fucking worst. Like you just get no sleep for so long, and it destroys you. And as soon as you adapt to one phase of you know what their life is, who they are as human beings at that point, and as soon as you have adapted to whatever the sleep pattern is or whatever those behaviors are they go and change it up and for the first you know year and a bit that's that's all that you get out of it and i don't know if you guys felt the same thing but as as a as a father as well that first year you get nothing from these kids they, they don't give a shit they just about take take you. they take. don't give a fuck about you they might get, crack a smile here and there <laughs> and maybe give you a laugh but that's it you get nothing they want mum because mum's got the goods. milk. And got the goods. Just, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that's what they're after. You're there to maybe, you know, you're, you're the comic relief occasionally <laughs> to, to make them chuckle. Comic relief. But for the first year, they don't give a fuck about you. I yeah, mean, wow. they'll give you the smile, that's it. But once you get to about a year and a half, mm. it changes dramatically. They're fucking sick of mum. Fuck mm. this. This is just, it's, it's boring at that yeah, point. Yeah. You know, and they've, they get real food now. They don't need that milk no more. Yeah, they might have true. a little bit of it. But you finally get to become a bigger part of their life. Of their life mm. And it's great. And you get to, you know, this a good, I felt at least uh, with probably both of them, there was a good six months of that before they hit the terrible twos, which is such a, a struggle for, for the most part. Because, you know, they've got a few words. Maybe they're... And again, all kids, you know, develop at different rates. So, you know, some probably more mobile than um, developed linguistically, I suppose. Um, and you get to three, you get to this three-nager stage where you get this false sense of security that it's it's going to be okay now because... Oh, I'm in it. Yeah, even, even though... The, <laughs> it is going to be all right, yeah, mate. It's, it's right? great. Well, it's, <laughs> Good luck, man. Thank you. Um, you get, because you get this false sense of security because, you know, the terrible twos are over and their their language skills have developed so much more that you can converse with them and explain to them why they shouldn't do this. What mm. you completely forget is 
They're fucking three, man. They're not rational. They, have, they can't rationalize what you're saying. <laughs> they don't no, listen. No, I, they're I stubborn. I hear your words. You're saying don't put my hand in the shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I don't understand why I can't do that, Dad. I'm going to do it. And I don't, don't trust your judgment on this one. I'm going to... I'm gonna pull rank on you, Dad. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna do it anyway. What? But well, that's um, that's the lesson, eh? Like, and that's yeah, it is. It's uh, like don't force them to do anything because they're like, don't say don't do that because they're gonna do it. Like they're gonna yeah. do the opposite. Of everything they're pretty much they're gonna do the opposite with everything that you say. So it's like you just gotta like just not yeah. freeze, but uh, like find another way to like. You gotta let them experience life, I suppose. Hundred percent. And the best part. It doesn't change when they turn four no. or five. They're still going to question your judgment and your knowledge of the world and your experience as a human. I'm dealing with a lot of teen angst from my youngest at the moment, which sucks because he only turned seven last week. Then we've got all of this fucking teen angst and this, you know, and it's both of them. Even, even Kingston, who's, you know, nine at the end of this year, it doesn't matter what, life experience you have and what you can teach them they're going to disregard it anyway you can give them all of the lessons that you learn and try and make them learn from your mistakes but the only you know the best lessons in life can't be taught they have to be learned true that yeah true that so uh in regards to like the the first year and you were talking about like sleep deprivation so what are we looking at what what, what how much sleep is a is a new father <laughs> Getting. Look, I went into both um, both pregnancies and um, infancies of the child unhealthy. Yeah, I was overweight. Um, I was just not mentally healthy. I wasn't, you know, mentally resilient. I was, I was just not um, not at my peak by any stretch of the imagination. And first time, fair enough. You don't know what you're getting into. Yeah. Second time, fucking shame on me for that one, man. Like, I should have known what was coming and I should have got healthier. And you know, prep for it like a fucking marathon. Maybe, you know, if, if I was to find myself in the situation again, I reckon for the first maybe two trimesters, I would train myself to have fuck all sleep, but at least eat healthy. Yep. Just get ready for what's coming. And that last three months, I'd probably just get as much sleep as possible before it happens. Mm, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it and it, look, it depends on the child. Some, you know, on, on the individual. My yep. two were completely different, but it's, you just don't know when you're going to get sleep at all. And you can try and, you know, communicate with one another over to, you know, who's going to get up at, you know, yeah. nights versus day and maybe we'll rotate and, and things like that. But your sleep patterns are all over the place and you might not get to sleep even when it is your turn to sleep. So, yeah, it's a rough couple of months. But in saying that, though, like, you just work it out. Yeah, 100%. Like, you, I've never experienced, like, sleep deprivation, like, like in that in that first year with my oldest. My second, it's been a breeze. She's been sleeping, like you said, they're, they're different. So, like, she's five months in and she sleeps through. That's incredible. Like, you know, and my that first, amazing. probably in the first five months, she, was, she wasn't too bad either. And, and my... um. Yeah, my youngest, she's got, she's teething at the moment as well. She's sleeping through the teething. Like, it all depends on the human and, like, their makeup as well. So, I think the biggest lesson was you, ju you just work it out. Like, you just, you can just function. And, like, but the purpose, like, your purpose is so strong now because you've got this family. You can't just fuck around, man. You, you, you just, you just got to like, deal with it and kick and move on and work it out. I think there's a lot of merit to the purpose, mm. the f focus on purpose mm -hmm. that you just highlighted, Anth. I would say the only reason why I made it through that period on two occasions uh, without lashing out at people was because I felt really enthusiastic about supporting my wife primarily and then obviously supporting the kids too. Because I felt enthusiastic about getting up in the middle of the night, I didn't feel angry about it and I didn't feel sad about it. I actually felt fulfilled by it. Mm. And that, uh, in terms of, I guess, what was happening subconsciously and psychologically for me uh yeah it wasn't a bad experience it was a trial but it wasn't a bad experience and i think that enthusiasm or that purpose and and having that at the forefront of my mind is what made it maybe a little bit different for me than what it could have otherwise been sounded like you had the correct attitude of mind mm. for sure you know I to just so. not be bothered by that and just get up and be enthusiastic even though you got to get up at three in the morning you don't really have a choice, eh? No, like, you don't. Exactly. So that's that's the difference. Like your sense of responsibility changes as well. Mm. So you just you're just doing it because you 
for one, for the for the love of it, because yeah. you're a dad now, um, and two, you don't have a choice. So let's just get it done. Otherwise, it's gonna like it, it'd be even worse potentially. Of course, yeah. If you don't tend sort to it the out, child, yeah. it's gonna cause traumatic, you know, experiences in that child from a young age. If if if, if it's constantly getting neglected, mm. it's, it's the last thing a child needs, especially in those subconscious early years. So it's. Yeah, I'd say that's super important, you know, and I guess, you know, that's a trade-off, you know, you want to have kids, you want to do the next generation, you're going to lose a lot of sleep, there's going to be a lot of sleepless nights and you're going to be drained and yeah, sometimes I'm, <laughs> sometimes I'm whinging that I didn't get enough sleep, I don't have kids yet, so but I, should, I, should, I should just shut the fuck up. No, yeah. <laughs> it's different, man, it's different, it's different, like I felt less sleep deprived when they were first born and I was getting up three times a night or we were collectively mm. getting up three times a night, then when they get up once a week because they're sleeping well, but they get up once a week in the middle of the night complaining about, you know, whatever, wanting me to go down there and, and lay on the ground in their bedroom. And I feel more sleep deprived then. Like it's almost like my body was prepared for it. Mm, yeah. And I don't know how it happened because I didn't do marathons or anything like that, right? <laughs> but, but it's like it happened and it was fine. It was like, like it was on fire. It was, it was challenging, but it, I didn't feel as sleep deprived as I do now when I get woken up just randomly by them, and I'm not used to it. A strange mm. experience. Body condition conditioning. I reckon. I reckon. I've, heard, I've read that um, like even the male hormones change when you're a new new child comes into the world, so you're set up for those situations, like like the mother is, and then obviously as they grow older, the, the hormonal situation changes as well. So you're probably more tired because you don't have that. That the capacity anymore to like take on all that non-sleep i guess i definitely agree with that that's so interesting how the body adapts and hormonal changes happen for men you know we, we might think it happens for women and then men i'm just saying but it's yeah. it has to it has to be for men as yeah well. we play a big role like i think we need to remember that the men actually play a big role in not only the pregnancy but also in the first year as well and obviously post as well so uh, you can't expect everything to be to all, all the changes that happen to women. Like we're, we're a massive part of it, and I think that's something we need to remember again. Yeah, I, and we do have a big role and purpose in this. Mm. I heard something that made me smile, and I shared it with women, and I, they were scoffing. But yeah. I heard it from a, a scientist, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who yep. some people might have listened to as well. Good old Dr. Andrew Huberman, and he referenced that the male body changes, like the hormones change, and that men put on weight put on fat because they're well supposedly i guess just looking back historically uh the body's preparing for getting up in the middle of the night and energy sources yeah mm. so it's like wow. if you're becoming a dad uh or you are a dad and you've got excess fat like don't fight it that's Natural, apparently, based upon so Matt, you're gonna need it soon. You're gonna need it. It's all right. I can have that bag of Cheetos now. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily say mean that you, you should eat poorly, but if you can't get rid of it and you're doing everything you can, don't feel demoralized by that because it's it is your body again, based upon this scientist getting ready to get to get up in the middle of the night, and then definitely that dissipates once that period's over, in my experience. And like that, as in, it's easier to lose weight. Ah, man, all these physiological changes. It's so interesting. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know about that. It's Women cool. may not like to hear that, but I, I, <laughs> maybe it was just the way that I pitched it because I pitched it as a joke. <laughs> and actually, talking about physiological changes, can we take a quick break? Yes, we can pause there. <laughs> Two, one. All right, and we're back, nice and refreshed, um, ready for segment three. Um, balancing fatherhood and life. I think that's a huge one. Massive. Very, very important one. Um, let's discuss how each father has balanced their roles as fathers with other aspects of life such as work, personal interests and hobbies. Um, what are some of the sacrifices that you have made? Do you want to go first, Dan? i go first, yeah. Um, there's definitely a grieving process for sure when you um, bring a child into your life there's this like sense of freedom that you had that's sort of not there anymore or like the amount of time that you had to do what you want is definitely minimized or reduced, which is totally cool though because for me, not that I expected my life to be the same, but I was prepared for um, my life to be totally different. 
and through that it allowed me to just to get clear on what's important um because having a child forces you to like rethink your whole life because you've, you've, you're responsible for a human being now and like going out and playing with your mates is not a big like not a priority anymore um you know looking after yourself is like your self-care is definitely a priority um although i had like a really good routine um, i was obviously working in the city i come home i was i was, had a gym membership i was going to the gym three times a week yoga meditation all that sort of stuff went went to shit pretty much in that first <laughs> six or 12 months. Yeah. But that's cool. Like I had this, we, I spoke to like other dads previously and they sort of like warned me about this. Like your, your life is going to be different and your routines are going to change dramatically. And I guess I was, I was expecting that. But if you if you're not expecting that and you go into this, you're fucked. Like it, it will just destroy you yes. because like it's such a dramatic shift to your, to your lifestyle that, yeah, you, you sort of, you sort of need to want to be prepared for that because it, it just like gone cold turkey is yeah. is, is pretty full on. It's, you don't you don't want to build resentment to your situation. Totally, you totally. Oh, well and said. Yeah. Resentment, yeah. exactly. Mm. And I feel um, I got lucky, I guess, because like I spoke about earlier, I had this like really awesome community. There were seven seven couples that had a home birth within like eighty months of each other. Yeah. Well. And a couple like myself and two other couples had like our first like within three months of each other and so based on that we also created a mum's group and a dad's group so That's pretty much special, like f- a few months after i think the last one would have been like yeah so say it was th- three months after my first um the last the last sort of couple had theirs and then post that then we started having these these catch-ups we used to go down by the river have a fire and just talk about our lives and being dads and what does that mean and there was some 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 of the guys were ahead of us, so they yeah. had some some lessons for us. Okay, yeah. watch out, you know, it's a six month mark. This is going to happen, and so we we're just communicating like our lives and being able to process sh- what was going on in a safe space. Um, and it's always nice to have a fire with a group with a group of guys. Oh, man, like there's 100%. something about that. That's so like, wholesome. Just, yeah, it's so it's primal wholesome, and because um, we don't have like f- for the woman like that's sort of the, the birth process is their rites of passage. Exactly. But for us, we don't really have those sort of like. Where's our right of passage? Yeah, we don't have that. But and I think, but I think, yeah. If, yeah, if I had to think back now, though, like being a dad is a, is a, is a right is of passage. Right? It's right not a vision passage. quest, you know. It's not a walkabout, but it's a, some sort of right of passage for us. So, of course. Um, for me, I did a lot of work, a lot of growth pre, even pre relationship. Like I was just like really into like personal growth and really like going into my my psyche and like what what makes me tick, like what what are my fears, what are some of my anxieties. You know what what stresses me out, and then working through those, either through like any form of means, like plant medicine, seeing a psychologist, counselling, talking, communicating with my my mates, communicating with my partner, um, and getting it's getting clear. I'm like, who am I, and who what type of person I want to become. So, the more prepared, I guess, the more deep inner work that you do leading up to having a child, the better prepared you're going to be because a lot of these unexpected situations are going to come at you, and be, you got you got the tools to deal with them. So. Um, yeah, I was, I was saying that though, like it's it's not easy. It's challenging as hell and it's so rewarding. But I, I feel like I've implemented some strategies around, um, I guess for me, communication is the biggest one with, yep. with your partner. Yep. Like I, I still love going camping with my mates. I still like hanging out with my mates. Like that's something that's really important to me. I still love my meditation. It's all my breath work practices. I need to do like my, you know, my floats, um, yoga, all that sort of stuff. So being able to communicate, you know, with your partner around these are the things I need to do, but obviously not taking the piss and just doing it every, every day, every week, because you need to find that balance as well. And, of course. And there's and for the woman, that's like there's a lot of resentment because they're stuck with you know raising the child, and you know I'm I'm the breadwinner in the family, so I'm working, and so I get this free time, and they're pretty much like my, she's a full time mum, so she's yeah. not working at the moment, and there is some resentment that I have all this freedom, and I can catch up with the other dads. You know, I have another men's group that I catch up with online with some guys in um, in the states. So I had these avenues, and it's making sure that she also has these avenues as well because mm. they also support, need to pro- yeah, yeah, support. process and support what they're going through. So for me, it's one of the biggest sort of transitions, um, and there's a massive identity crisis as well that happens when you become a father because, like I said, like this life that you had is totally different to the life that this new life that you have, but it's so much more wonderful and rewarding. But it's just different. And you need to sort of be prepared for that, the differences. 
the transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of that is managing expectations. You're managing expectations Correct. with your um, partner or the mother of your, your children, managing expectations with yourself as well. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, your life uh, pre-having children is completely different uh, in terms of, you know, uh, finding a work-life balance, um, doing the things that you used to do, still being out, still having the freedom to do those things, whether it's hanging out with friends or whatever other extracurricular things that you would have done, um, and still finding the time to do that. Particularly, you know, if you are still in uh, a live-in relationship with the mother of your children. My mm. particular uh, situation is different to that. Uh, the you know my my children's mother and I separated probably what was it I think Kingston was three or two yeah Kingston just turned three so he was about a year and a half uh, something like that um, and at the time it was you know obviously a, a pretty big thing for all parties um, concerned. And it was, you know, obviously something to adapt to. And, you know, at the start it wasn't too bad. It got a little toxic for a while after that, pretty volatile and, and whatever. And I'll keep it as succinct as possible because that is really, you know, a subject for another podcast. But we got to a much better place in the last year and a half or so. Um, so much better, where we'll get along so much better than we ever did it's good to hear. at the start or even when we were together, I think. Um, and I think a big part of that as well is because of the kids because we had to keep it civil the whole way through to create a better environment for them. And, and do I it for them. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think it's best that we did separate at the time because it would have been a very toxic environment for the kids to uh, be raised be in, raised in yeah. had we stayed together. Um, but now we're at this point where we get along like a house on fire, um, except that it doesn't burn down like a, a house would, which is good. <laughs> It just rages forever. But um, <laughs> but we do actually get along quite well. And like I say, I, I feel like a big part of that is because the kids got to a point where they do get older and they do get wiser and more intelligent and they start to try and play you off against one another because you don't live in the same house. They're, they're having these what can I get different from mum? What can I get from dad? Exactly. And the only way that you can stay on top of that is by communicating with one another. And the only way to make that work is to communicate with each other respectfully and effectively. So and true. obviously that put us in a position where we can actually, you know, enjoy each other's company and, and be able to, um, you know, communicate, you know, and be in each other's lives and still do things as a family. You know, occasionally we'll go on, you know, take them all, you know, to a movie together as a family or, you know, have dinner as a, as a family, even though we are in two separate households as, you know, two yeah. mini families that are also one. But I digress. I guess what I'm trying to, to say there is that my experience is somewhat different because whilst there are still sacrifices being made, um, we both, obviously me a lot more so than she does, have our free time still mm. because you know, for however much of the week they're with her, even though the parts where they're not with me, I will have work or have what else. I do have more time than the average person would, I think, uh, to still do the things that, that mean something to me. There, It's not to say that that's not without certain sacrifices, whatever they may be, but I think, it, yeah, for me, it's, um, it, it's always been a bit more um, free-flowing uh, I guess the 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 ability to to do the things that I wanted that that are important for me to do, whatever that may be, whether it's you know um, you know self whether it's self development or even just uh, self care, whether mm. it's taking care of yourself and going to the gym and trying to not binge on things outside of that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I I feel like for me I, I've I've been fortunate in that way, and and I'm grateful to have that. Mm. And you're doing the right thing too. You're just spending so much time with the kids, and you're still doing. Um, you know, activities with the mother as well. And, you know, for the kids, that'll be so important. Yeah, it's absolutely. Good that you do that. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said about the kids playing you off yeah. against each other when you're not in the same house. Oh, Sage, yeah. our eldest, <laughs> she spends uh, effectively four days a week with her grandparents, my uh, wife's parents, and they're amazing. And she'll come home and she'll say that she ate like 
a lot of donuts or a lot of cookies <clears> because <throat> she knows that we don't like her eating that stuff Ooh. or that she watched lots of TV because she knows that, well, we don't have a TV. And we've t- I've told her many times why we don't have a TV because I don't want her to be watching it at such a young age. And so she'll tell us that she's done all these things and now I know that she's lying. Ah. <laughs> she's actually lying. She might have had one. She might not have had the whole, like, a lot of cookies. She might have had one or she might have had none. And she'll say that she had heaps. Oh, well, I was working just, at your mum's house, man. She was giving me a lot of... Uh, this is this is the other grandmother. <laughs> oh, the other grandma. Oh, okay, okay. So You're not, right, my mum. Not, not trying to get your mum in trouble. If she was she's making me sausage rolls, everything. My mum's pretty good. Like, if she was with my mum, yeah, guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> She'd be just eating sugar. So, yeah. yeah. It's so interesting how they play, they play each other off to get what they want. Yeah. You know? Master manipulators. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Incredible how smart they are. Like, yeah, yeah. like we have the same situation. Like, so, so they always play, they'll play myself and my wife off all the time. And we're just like, what's going on here? Like, I doubt my mum, my, my wife would have done that. But then the grandparents is a different story. Like, I think a big topic as well, a conversation, probably not for this podcast, but is the grandparents and how you deal with like other people parenting your yep. kids because they're, they're going to program them in different ways. Oh, and yeah, we've got our own that. standards and our own parenting styles. And then, like, we don't also, we started not watching TV again because um, we just felt like, it was just um, her her emotional system and the nerve system was just not not regulated at all when she watched TV and we've seen the results of her not watching TV for like two I like think two and a half weeks now she's so much more creative her imagination has gone to another level she doesn't even ask us for TV what about attention know. span to just like way she's better incredible like yeah. just a whole, totally different kid obviously still emotionally fiery and stuff like that but it's yep. normal for a three year old yep. but I just saw the results of like not having a screen or a TV in front of them how much they can just like so good. stuck start like you know Tapping into their environment, yeah, and, and into yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the inner creativity and inner wisdom and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is, um, this is, yeah, it's like good on you, Josh, for like mm. not introducing that from the beginning. Yeah, thank you. The best uh, example of that was a friend of mine who's a psychologist. He read a book, which he recommended that we read too. Uh, and he gave it to his parents and he said, This is what we're doing, mm-hmm. read it. And they just did what he asked them to That's do. Great. He's a very, very like, uh, yeah, forthright person. Mm-hmm. My wife is not very forthright and they're with her parents and her parents are amazing. But we told them that we didn't want too much sugar and we told them that we didn't want TV. And those two things still happened to some degree. It wasn't completely... And it's fine. But because they don't have as open communication in their family as I did in my family or my friend did, um, those topics were just... A cause for resentment mm-hmm. rather than cause for conversation. So having mm-hmm. those conversations, I think you're right, Anth, are yeah. important, really important. And we'll like, you know, oh, we'll just pick our battles. It's like one day a week. And we're like, no, like we're not going to pick our battles. This is how we want to raise our child. Yeah. Our These, are These are non-negotiables. These are non-negotiables. And yeah. sorry, like can be really a, tough. a lot of the grandparents, like this is like the way they buy their love, yeah? Through like yeah. all these gifts of and course, like, food and all this sort of dopamine stuff. Dopamine levels go up. Oh, 100%. Sure. Oh, oh, we love hits. our grandparents. But and then um, you got to deal with their sugar crash. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And materialism. Mm-hmm. You know, here's this Presence. gift. Here's this thing. <laughs> mm. Where yeah. you know, myself and and Katie, their mother, uh, are both on the same page. Where, you know, we we a- apart from the environmental factor, you know, all of this shit that costs money and is being bought and is only going to end up in a landfill. It just, I, I feel anyway, and I'm sure so most true. of you will agree, it just sort of conditions them to expect things and feel i mean i'm yeah it boggles the mind to me that you know you people can buy so many things constantly for 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 children where they're entertained by the 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 most simplest of things you know you can give them the box that the toy came in they're going to get equally as much enjoyment out of that box by pretending it's a fort than they did by the whatever the fuck was in that box in the first place. The so bubble true. wrap that they can pop. Yeah, stomping it. Exactly. My yeah. God, it's the time of their life. They'll just do it for hours. Mm. But, I mean, we're, we're, we're the same. Um, I have a TV, but I seldom watch it. And I, the kids never really watch anything except that they are at that age now where they're playing footy. You know, Kingston's decided he, he's got his life planned out. He wants to play footy for Richmond and then when he retires he's going to be an author and that's that's what he wants wow. to do that's cool it's yeah. so cool. great nice. because, but that's the thing like the only thing that he'll watch on TV or get be allowed to watch is footy or some other sport occasionally if the yep. tennis is on yep. like one of the Grand Slams not just anything at all they don't really watch cartoons 
and they get super creative because of that. They'll either, you know, make shit with Lego yep. or they'll sit there drawing and he'll, you know, make comic books and, you know, he'll write them and Zeon. Sometimes they'll collaborate and, you know, one will write, the other one will illustrate or they'll just work on stuff together and they'll fucking fight 90% of the time. But that other 10% is amazing because they're just working together and they're not just sitting there like zombies watching shit on TV. We don't really, they don't have any devices of their own. They don't really use an iPad. Occasionally I'll let them play, uh, use Duolingo on my phone That's because cool. they're already learning Spanish at school anyway. So why not try to, you know, complement that? Um, but yeah, I mean, you give them all of these, you know, creature comforts that we have in this modern world that we live in. And it, it's important to rem remain cognizant of the fact that this is the world that they're going to grow up in. And it's important that they know how to navigate this technological world that we live in, but also not just completely inundate them with it to the point that they need it constantly. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's what I respect, uh, you know, from you, you dads. You, you aren't throwing a tablet to them and being like, oh, yeah, just go on YouTube and then you go back to whatever you were doing. I see that happen a lot. And th that's definitely not good long-term for the kid because it's just going to destroy their attention spans. Yeah, and you want to be like, who, who do you want, like, who, who do you have parents in your kids? Like, do you have yeah. like a TV? Do you have a screen? Do you have YouTube? That's the thing. Like, even school system as well. Like, there's so many different, like, avenues where that people can, like, your kids can be, like, educated through and, like, you don't have control and if you yeah. want to have more control over your parenting then you need to like be more involved in that sense and like have like more f firmer rules but also allow them to naturally develop and grow themselves as well you don't want to have too many rules and like, don't do this don't do that you want them to actually like freely move through the life and allow them to like in that innately just like bring out the best in them through yeah. through their own play guiding well. them mm. not restricting them because sometimes when you restrict well that's what i learned like too much restriction and then you you kind of you crave freedom you need, they need boundaries though as well yeah, yeah. Like of course of course it's that balance yeah 100% yeah so true. the, the uh, basic reason just came to me why it's a good idea to avoid TVs uh, and, and the science if I recall incorrectly or the studies is that before two years old it's really bad for them between two and five it's quite it's unknown but probably bad for them and after five, it's, uh, I don't, don't think it's as big of a deal based upon the research that I read. Mm. And uh, the, the, I remember hearing Jordan Peterson talking about where mental illness comes from. And if I recall his words, it was an inability to deal with complexity. It was referenced earlier, I think mm. by Matt, that we're, they're living in a technological age. It's a more complex age that they're going to be growing up in than any of us have ever grown up in ever before. Right. And so they need to have the creativity, I think, Anth, that you reference, to be able to deal with unusual circumstances that their forefathers and mothers haven't had to deal with. And I see that in my daughter. I see how, like you reference, Matt, an uh, enormous amount of gifts given to her at, at, at Christmas. She is a consumer. And I see that no TV, apart from at her, one of set of her grandparents' place, she is unbelievably creative and can play and imagine and at daycare she's the same and at home she's the same at, f at almost four years old just constantly making up things like that she's playing with stories etc she's telling imagination stories. Yeah. yeah and so not giving them tv i think based on my experience with sage is like it's obvious that it has an impact and what, what we heard went to that summit the ai yeah. summit yeah. last week and, was, and the guy was saying um steve jobs didn't allow his kids to have iPhones until they were 16. He made it. And he made yeah. the iPhone. So yeah. <laughs> what does that say? Yeah, exactly. Good call. Yeah. Well, definitely, you know, like us, we had Nokias when phones first came Snake. out. Snake yeah, 2. Yeah, we had Snake. Snake was amazing. Snake 1, Snake 2, you know, that was a big deal for us. Like, look at these Snake little. 2 was a big improvement. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was. It had a head <laughs> instead of just the block. Um, yeah, so we've, we've grown up through that technological revolution and, um, you know, like we've seen what it what it does to people and you know like it's 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 full on it's a lot you know especially and for a kid that's the thing right by the time we were 15 16 18 that's when you know the smartphone just started like and you wonder if adhd is like a result of like just like the technological yeah. revolution yeah exactly yeah 
and all the so notifications because hmm. it's 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 it, it's very it can be very over, overwhelming mm-hmm. and know? even in, i'm not saying for kids but even adults yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. the, yeah for adults so you know for, for children like in this day and age to you know to have that kind of technology at a young age you know, i admire you, you guys for you know taking a step back and be like no nah, no nah, you know not yet you know when they're ready a bit later on you know just be out in nature yeah, experience life the the way we did, you know. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Yeah, super important. Actually, I want my kids to have less TV than I had. I had lots. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> TV. I, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, wait it, for Dragon Ball Z. Just wait, uh, wait, and he's gone. Ah, yeah. thirty <laughs> minutes. I'm like, God damn it! I got to wait another day. <laughs> yeah. That was me too. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it was a good thing. Well, it was only like back then, you know, analog TV. We didn't have, we didn't have the, the internet wasn't around then. So maybe we had like a certain segment of time, like uh, get up early in the morning, get ready for school. Yeah, you get to watch an episode of something. But it was only like half an hour, you, mm. you know, like all the, all the stuff, like when we come home from school, it's all boring adult stuff. You don't want to <laughs> care news. about the news. It was the news. It's boring. Um, yeah. So uh, we, we will digress. Um, segment four, lessons learned. Um, let's share some of the most important lessons that you guys have learned from being a dad. Um, discuss personal growth, changes in perspective, how fatherhood has shaped you guys. Um, and share new advice for fathers that are considering starting a family. Um, I want to start with this quote from Russell Brand. Um, Russell Brand mentions... In the best case scenario, the best case scenario, they are walking into a future that you won't be able to guide them through. He paused for 10 seconds after that statement. It looked like he was going to cry. As you can see that that statement affected him. What gives you, what that gives you is an understanding of your place in the world. And, you know, I, I, when I watched that, I was just like, Phew. You know, you're, they're walking into a future that you won't be able to guide them through. Like, how, how heavy is that? You know? Scary as well. Like, mm. if, I th- if I think about it, having two girls, like, how can I be, like, the male role model that they need and when the time comes for them to interact with boys and men, that they are so self they got this like this self confidence and self worth that like they can succumb like situations that could be like negative towards them. So it's like how do you, how do we as dads as parents become create the be the role models for them, but also do enough of our inner work so we don't project our insecurities onto them as well. So yeah. it's like so true. The lessons that I've learned is like do the fucking work beforehand. Like really understand yourself. And who you are, and as a couple as well, your relationship. You know, Matt, like you know, you said your your relationship was toxic, but now it's beautiful. Mm. So imagine the the change in your you know your kids seeing both of you now compared to then back then, and Absolutely. the impacts they're going to have now. They're going to have like this beautiful, uh, my, your parent like their parents are like communicating positively without any like sort of like dysfunction, and the environment is so much more cleaner now. It's like it's yeah, 100%. it's positive. And I think um, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think that's part of you know the reason that um, their mother and I, you know, started to get along uh, and, you know, be able to co-parent so effectively um, was that also that need to um, show them what, you know, respectful communication um, looks like. Mm. And because because you're right, it's absolutely critical uh, in raising children full stop let alone raising two boys to show them what that needs to look like how they need to be respectful to to other people irrespective of gender but also not irrespective also very much so when they're going to um need to interact with women or girls and women the older that they get um yeah because you've got two boys you know it's the the opposite of yeah, yeah. situation, and, and it, it is it is really important, I suppose, to um, to instill you know these values into them uh, as they grow up and, and raise them to to try and make sure that we're raising good men. Um, it's crucial waters. in these days and times as well. Man. Absolutely, yeah. 
So Can question. I ask a, Matt, uh, a question to Matt? Of course, please. please. Do. So my family's not very great socially and I'm 36 now and I would um, it's debatable whether I'm okay socially, but I've spent a lot of time in my adulthood sort of developing my social skills. Your kids seem to have that naturally and it's probably been passed down to you from you and your wife maybe, but regardless, can you explain if you see kids who are not quite socially as capable as your kids and, and how you parent them differently, can you please shed some light on that for us parents who are interested? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I'm not really sure if I have all the answers to that. Um, I don't know that it necessarily comes naturally to um, Kingston and Zeon, uh, but I think they've sort of picked that up along the way. Uh, and it's, uh, to some extent, I suppose it kind of goes back to talking about technology and TV and devices and them not having access to that and us reading to them from a young age. So whether or not they were, you know, automatically going to be more um, linguistically developed than other kids at, at the ages that they were, um, I, I can't really attest to. But They um, seem to be so confident, though, from the stories uh, you've told me, look, in comparison to my daughter specifically, right, who has had all of the everything that you just referenced mm. and i'm curious to know what you think it might be about what you have done there's definitely been t instances where they haven't had that confidence um and it really comes down to their mood on the day as well actually i had that um a, a few weeks ago i'd taken zeon with me to um a friend's son's birthday um which was at a uh, ended up being in a bowling alley in, in Preston and Z just wasn't having a bar of it. Like he just didn't want to bowl even though they had an alley where the the um, or lane, I should say, where only the kids were playing. Mm. But all the other kids, I think the eldest was like maybe three or four. And as the newly seven-year-old, it's like, pfft, nah. Who are these losers? Pretty much. Like <laughs> yeah. it just, whereas like a year or two earlier, it would have been the opposite of that because up until Z started or probably got halfway through prep and he still is, but he used to just be, and, and I say this with no ego, no bullshit, but he used to be, he was, and is, I suppose the kindest human being I'd ever met in my life. The most considerate person. Like I'd never met anyone as kind and thoughtful and caring as this person. And he still has that some of the time, but he's also how do I put this lightly? No, that, no, he's he's wonderful, but he has his moments. Um, and I guess what I was trying, I digress a bit. What I was going to say is what I've always tried to do is get them to be involved in whatever I'm doing when they're with me. If we're at the shops, cool, here is some money. I'll, I'll get these things. Can you guys go buy those? Whether you go to, whether it's at a, a grocer and say, you know, go and get me a watermelon or get me some you know, raspberries or whatever we're going to need for, for dinner or dessert, uh, whatever later on. Can you guys go there? Here's some money. You do it. You need to learn how to interact with the world around you. Mm, instill some independence in them. Absolutely. But Thank then you. there's times where it doesn't work. Like I say, we're at this bowling alley and Z just wanted a hot dog. He wanted something off the menu. Cool. If you're hungry, here's some money. Go buy it. And I guess the counter was too high and he felt ignored and no one attended to him. I'm like, come on, I'll help you lift it. And he didn't want to have a bar of it. So then he just sat on the floor with his back to the counter, blocking up about 60% of the bar so other people couldn't order. And like, you know what? <laughs> cool, man. Have a few minutes to chill out and we'll talk later. So it could, it could be that you let them fail? Maybe more than to some extent, I was let yeah. fail? Maybe. It sounds like that could be a good option. Thank you. It's all good. Well, you learn from failure. Absolutely. It's one of the best ways to learn, to be honest. I think it's a, a healthy amount of failure is probably a good thing. Oh, most, most definitely. Sure. I mean, yeah. I think, what is it? Most successful people fail more than unsuccessful people even try. So That is so true, man. That is so true. Did he end up eating the hot dog? Yeah, only after I ate all the chips and half the hot dog. <laughs> and, <yeah. laughs> you gave it a shot, man. That's all... <laughs> It's all that matters, you know. Slowly, slowly, he'll he'll be able to order his own stuff, and yeah. I mean, look, I think we've we've all we've all grown in this real this fatherhood parenthood relationship, and that's part of the journey. And in my mind specifically, everyone involved, whether it's my children, are growing. Obviously, not just physically and and emotionally and mentally, but their mother um, has has 
you know, changed, as evolved as a person, as have I, where we're not the people that we were back when we were uh, in a relationship. Um, and I guess part of it is learning how to deal with conflict, whether it's with her or with the kids, because obviously there's going to be these instances where the kids have their little tantrums over things, and it's very easy to, you know, react emotionally to that react to it on a personal level and it's important to you know to try and stay above that and i feel like for the most part in the last couple of years in particular i've uh, i feel like i've gotten better at, at dealing with these moments and i'm sure most parents would find the same thing but i think it's really in terms of lessons and takeaways from these things it's really important that to, to be aware of the fact that it's not always going to work Mm. You know, like you can, you can try to de-escalate things and you can try to, you know, help them calm down organically and try to rationalize things and explain things to them. And sometimes it'll work. There's been plenty of times where it has, but there's also times where it doesn't. And there's going to be times where you do react and then you're going to feel shit about that later mm. on because yeah, I shouldn't have, you know, God damn it. They're only shouldn't have cracked it. They're seven years old. Why am I getting yeah. upset? They, if, if they can't, if I, as a, 39 year old can't keep it together yeah, keep it together how do I expect a 7 year old to and it's really important not to beat yourself up agreed also don't beat them up that is <laughs> definitely I, yeah, 100% upon, that's that. rightly so yeah um I, I pushed my daughter over one day. She's standing in the she's standing in a doorway while that I was trying to walk through and I was feeling furious. Yeah, yeah. And so I just pushed her with my hand rather than step around her. Yeah, yeah. She fell on the carpet. But I told my friends at work and they were laughing and they're like, that's, that's like, that's battery. And like, yes, it is. <laughs> and it felt, and, and you know, that felt just as good as hitting anything. So <laughs> if you have to, yeah. you can give them a gentle shove and they're full over anyway on the carpet. Uh, it's I, okay. I find the best is like when you are frustrated and you like, you can't and shouldn't and definitely wouldn't, you know, take out your frustration in a physical way yeah. but then they like they run off and they like run into a wall or they slip over and fall fuck it's so satisfying like, <laughs> yeah, you did it oh, to yourself that's it I didn't thank you universe yeah. that'll teach them it yeah. won't teach them it won't at all they're going to learn nothing from any of this I love that thanks for sharing so can much. I share one thing yeah of course so for me the um, the big take home for, for since becoming a parent for me is that I don't have control and I didn't realize that what it meant to not have control until having a becoming a parent in so, so many ways. But with regards to becoming a dad, I thought I'd be a ready made dad and I wasn't. And I wasn't what it wasn't that my kids were surprising to me. It wasn't how my wife was, that was surprising to me. The thing that was so astounding was who I was when my kids came into the world, specifically my daughter. And so because she was the first and by the time my son came around, I'd had two years roughly to become acclimatized and become aware of how I was. So if you are not who you thought you were going to be, that's okay. Yep. And uh, something that Anth shared with us before we ha had this podcast, it was a really beautiful I guess uh, just discourse on a short discourse on what it is to be a father. And the part about that, that I want to highlight that was really meaningful to me was that everyone knows that a mother's heart and mind can change to become all about it, her children. But what people don't realize is that a father's heart and mind can change completely as well to become about their family. And that's what, certainly what I experienced. And was not expecting it. And only through accepting it was I able to start changing it in a way that I wanted to change it. Not accepting it, not being aware of it didn't help. And there was no change happening when I was just pushing it away. Yeah. That's, that's deep, you know. The role of like protecting and providing and that, that instinct kicks in for a man. And, you know, you, you want to protect your family at all costs you know if that's financially it's physically it's spiritually you know there's, there's a lot of a lot of responsibility and um, yeah, it does seem like you know when you make that step and you have a kid 
you know, those psychological physi- fi- and physiological changes as well. Mm-hmm. Like, as you guys were mentioning before, you can you put on fat as a father to prepare yourself for the sleepless nights. Yeah, um, that's why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> 15 tubs of ice cream for a reason. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of a lot of value in what you guys are saying. I'm sure a lot of a lot of fathers are going to be listening to this and saying, "Fuck, that's so true." Or, you know, getting ready for the next the next stage, because you know it, it really is a journey. That's for sure. From what I'm gathered, gathered. Yeah, yeah. And I think um I think a big thing is like ask for help and looking for support as well. Like mm-hmm. for me, I had a bit of a panic attack a month to go in with my first yeah. uh, child. Like I had to. I was like what the fuck am I doing? Like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, even though I was sort of prepared and I watched all sort of the videos and podcasts and, you know, we had a dollar and stuff. I was like, in the moment, I was like, I had this bit of a panic attack and I remembered this little podcast. There was a guy that was like supporting men through their like first time dads. Um, and so I gave him a call. Um, and I'm like, hey, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And just like, it was just so nice to talk to someone who's gone through it with you yeah. and they just calm me down and sort of like, sort of like remind me of, of, of things like, yeah, you, you're there to support. Um, you don't need to know everything, but all you need to do is know how to support your wife through these types of situations before. And, you know, this guy's got like a whole social enterprise now called Birthing Dads. And um, there's like, he's got a whole course out there as well, how to support men through the whole perinatal period, which is like yeah, from cool. conception f- from to birth and then the first 12 months. So there is, yeah. a, there is resources now out there. They're limited, but there is starting to build like a, yeah sort of a support network for, for, yep. for men through this period and also, you know, heaps of men's groups as well. So don't don't be afraid to ask for help because there is help out there now and support is going to allow you to be more engaged and more involved yeah. in, in this journey. And it's it's safe to feel that vulnerability to ask for support. Oh, you totally. Know, there's, there's so much empowerment in that for sure. Mm-hmm. And it's cool to hear that, you know, people are doing this stuff and they're doing courses and... You know, it's that's that's it's, it's a really cool thing. It's important. You know, I'm sure a lot of people can benefit from that. Definitely. So, um, such a paradox that you just highlighted. Yeah, yeah. vulnerability it's through vulnerability. Yeah. There's power. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. There, there is. Oh. There's there's strength in vulnerability. Being vulnerable and being able to admit to what shortcomings or what needs you know you have that need being met can can I guess strengthen your ability to navigate this world as as a human being of course it's like the the lobster when it sheds its its, uh, its shell and then creates a new one super vulnerable in that stage but as a result becomes a bigger lobster more powerful i've been listening to a lot That's of jordan yeah. it's it's from 12 rules analogy. of life <laughs> great analogy <laughs> um yeah no, that was great um, all right, let's let's go to segment five now. This is the the last one. Cool. Um, future hopes and dreams. Um, let, let's explore each father's hopes and dreams for their children's futures. Let's discuss what values and principles that you guys want to instill into your kids, and um, share any long term aspirations you guys have as fathers. It's uh, it's all about the future. You know what what you want for your kids yeah I can go um, for me like I just reflected on my own childhood and how way I was parented and yeah I love my mum and dad and they did the best they could and they were so supportive but also so critical at the same time and you know I just learned another thing like I would say is like just learn from your own childhood and your parents as well because take on the good stuff and just get rid of the shit stuff so yeah. for me it's about like how do I nurture these, these two little humans to be the best version of themselves. You know, what type of environment do I need to create for them so they can blossom into like their true potential? How can I nurture their potential? Mm. Like for me, because I felt like I didn't really have that. Like I, I, I was given like opportunities to, to grow and, but also I was, I was very like sort of like, you can't do this and you can't do that and why would you do that? And you should have done that better and like very critical um, type of like, you know, European parents. Authoritarian. Authoritarian, yeah. yeah. And like, that's what all they knew. They're like, you know, I can imagine like... They what copped they, it worse than what we yeah, copped it. A sure. hundred times worse than yeah. what we copped it. So I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks thanks for these lessons. And my parents are the most beautiful teachers ever in terms of like how to parent. Yeah. And even my, like my kids are like such teachers. Like everything's the whole, everything's a, a gift and a lesson. Mm. So for me, it's like, and my wife is like, how do we like create 
like the environments, like what type of school do we want them to go to? You know, what type of people do we want to be to role model like these values and behaviors that we want to instill in them? And also how much can, how much do we let go of as well? So they can just learn and you know, nurture their own sort of well-being um, and to create their own life for themselves. So it's like it's, it's a fine balance of all of it, to be honest. Um, but we, we want like them to sort of lead the way and the way I see us as, as, as guardians. We are guardians of them. Um, to, so they can sort of really reach that, that potential. So for me, it's around that. And then like outside of that, like I spoke about birthing dads, like how as a man who's gone through this journey of fatherhood, how can I educate and empower other men to like be the best version of themselves as well and be educated and, you know, involved in, in being a great parent, a great father, um, a great human being for themselves, the family and society. So it's just for me, it's like, I'm always about doing the work and, it can over, overwhelm me sometimes, but I see the such the potential in it and the reward for it as well. So I'm Definitely. just trying to create this fucking environment where men can just like fucking get their shit together and be the best version of themselves and yeah, fucking just take, take on 100%. like all the challenges um, that, you know, that come out of them with like respect and like sovereign and like being able to be critical thinkers and, you know, challenge the system when required and challenge their own morals and like, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty passionate about this Have type of stuff. Have an open mind. And, yeah, open you know, mind and critical, be vulnerable. Like create thinking, environments yeah. to be vulnerable because I think we spoke yeah. about vulnerability, how powerful that is. And, yeah. you know, like in the generations past, the vulnerability wasn't a big thing, but now it's sort of coming back um, Definitely. In, you know, in society. So I'm just seeing the power in being vulnerable and how it's changed me and my relationship with my partner as well. So being vulnerable in my relationship and not always trying to win all the conversations and the conflicts as well. Mm. And being coming from compassion and, and learn how to hold space for someone's like big emotions. And like, there's so much in this, like that I can unpack and probably hold another podcast about like men's work and men's stuff and yeah. for sure. But I feel like, yeah, just being the best version of yourself and then allowing your kids to like flourish in such a beautiful environment where they can. And they're not like there's potentials not capped, like allow them to be super uncapped. free. Yeah. Potential. Oh, I love that, man. That's my Absolutely. rant. Sorry, bro. That is fucking <laughs> no, incredible, that's fantastic. bro. Thank you. And, and Thank I second, you. you know, all of that, I suppose. Uh, I would say exactly the same things, you know, in terms of what I want for my children it, uh, and, and out of myself is to, you know, be the best parent that I can be and constantly evolve to meet their needs and to be able to, to give them what they need to succeed and help them succeed where I didn't succeed. And again, take from my upbringing from my own childhood everything that i feel worked uh that my parents did and whatever i feel was missing and be able to cater to their needs and i know that's a lot easier said than done yep um and it's going to require you know checking in with them as well even though that they don't explicitly know what they need or what they want but making sure that you know we're we're on this respectful you know same level and well not same level because I'm in charge. Fuck that. <laughs> so, no, no. I'm, They're not in charge. I'm not about that at all. There's definitely a, a level system here and I'm yeah. not on the bottom. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Fuck it. One day we um, will be if they're, but, if they're bad. If we're bad, they'll send us to the nursing home. Yeah, it's true. When they watch this one day, I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in, in terms of what I want for my boys, yeah. um, really, I guess... You know, if, if I could, you know, fast forward to the future and, and know that they lived a long, happy, healthy life with just the right amount of pain and suffering for them to appreciate mm. uh, and have gratitude for, you know, what they had and, and what they got. That's all I could really ask for. Yeah. It's beautiful, man. And thanks for your rant. I didn't take it as a rant. I really appreciate your insight in this space and dealing with men who are not aware of what's going on as someone who wasn't, who was less aware and still to a large degree am. Uh, a lot of respect that you're willing to work with us. So thank you so much. For me, what I want for my kids uh, is for them to be kind and considerate. Specifically for my son, I want him to be an open-hearted man because I think that's not a given. Uh, and kindness and consideration is the thing that we I talk about all the time with them consistently because my wife is very considerate. I am not considerate, but I'm very kind. My wife is not so kind. So we have you know both sides of that yep. and uh, acknowledging the relevance of that in the context of their relationships and how much better their relationships will be as long as they develop those two uh, traits as yep. much as possible is something that I 
uh, consistently talk with them about. And kindness, like there, it's kind of nebulous. Like I would describe kindness and consideration in this way. So consideration would be just being aware of other people and how our actions impact them. Yeah. I'm not considerate at all. So yeah, that's, that's okay. Uh, I'm all right with that. Kindness is something that I'm very familiar with and uh, it's not the same as nice being nice because being nice is not being authentic. Kindness is genuinely being true that. Yeah. Kind to somebody. You're a very kind person and you're very compassionate as well. Oh, so thank you. I'm glad that there's a bit of compassion as well as kindness. Thank For you. Sure, man. My favorite, I want to share this. My favorite uh, definition of kindness is not actually a definition, but something that I came across on the internet long, long ago, mm-hmm. and it's up on our fridge and it'll be there forever. Uh, it is uh, kindness can be defined as loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. Wow. So that's something that is really important because even I, as a kind person, remind my wife of her weakness a fair bit and it's not that useful. Not all the time. Yeah. Could, so, you, repeat, could you repeat that again? Yeah. Kindness is loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. Wow. Love that. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Really good. Never heard that before. You got it on your fridge, huh? Yeah. Good man. <laughs> good man. Um. All right, in conclusion, let's um, talk about key points. What are the key points that we can take from this podcast? You're not in control. Mm. It's a big one. And you don't need to be in control. No. Yeah, Just, surrender. Yeah, control Surrender. Control what you can and, and don't try to... Don't get caught up in the things that are beyond your own control. Mm. And just ride the wave. Mm weather the storm as best you can uh, and just know with it, with every with every hard time that comes with parenthood as with everything else that you know this too shall pass you know whether it's good or bad you know all of the good times and all of the bad times like everything else in life are going to come to an end that's impermanence so I guess it's, it's for me a lot of the time it's remaining cognizant of that through the the peaks and the troughs yeah. for those good times where things are really good knowing that this is maybe this is as good as it gets for a while and when things go pear-shaped and go uh, whether it's a short term having a you know frustrating moment with the kids or anything else in life knowing that this is also going to pass at some point yeah. whether it balances out or shoots back up is also beyond my control and just be ready for whatever it brings so well said man so well said. Um, and do you have any key points? For me, if I think back about what my lessons in this part of this journey is, yeah, be prepared, especially through the pregnancy. I think being, like in terms of just focus on birth and pregnancy, I think being prepared and being able to understand your partner's love languages and attachment styles so mm-hmm. then you can sort of like hold space for them in the, in the way yeah. that they would need and they, yeah. and they, um, they want. Yeah. Instead of trying to do things like touch, if they're not, if their lung, love language is not to be is not touch, then don't touch them. Maybe they, it's words of affirmation, so it's like you know affirmations around you know support and how well they're doing. So yeah, really, really understanding the worlds like your world, your wife's world, the, the world, the, the container of the relationship as well, but also getting support around you know pregnancy and birth and going in there prepared and involved and you know definitely involved. Like be part of it, learn as much as you can because. The more supported she feels, the, the stats show the, the the better birth that better, better birth outcomes that they have. So, Amazing. hospital birth or home birth, whatever you guys whatever is chosen, um, you want your partner to go in there like with the most amount of support and confidence, so they don't go into that adrenaline and fear state. Yeah. They want to be in that love oxy, oxy, oxytocin t- state where they can just like, yeah, naturally deliver or feel so confident in themselves that um yeah they can. True that man. Mm. True that. Man, I have so much gratitude for you boys coming here today to talk about fatherhood and, you know, such a beautiful topic to talk about, you know, um, be able to make it happen and, you know, be in a vulnerable kind of state because like doing this, it's not, you know, not just any father would be able to do this. So I really, I really appreciate it. You know, you guys telling stories and, you know, 
making a meaningful connection to the audience as well. I'm sure, you know, a lot of fathers are going to be looking at this saying, oh, you know, this is, this is exactly what I needed to hear, you know. I will reach out or I will do this and this and or I will be more conscious of my actions in front of the kids. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a beautiful thing, man. And, um, yeah, to any fathers listening, you know, feel free to share your experiences in the comments and, um, you know, reach out and, you know, talk about, you know, certain situations and, um, you know, make a, you know, give it your all. You know, I, I, I've learned so much from you guys just today um, and you are very ins inspiring to me. And, um, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to doing, you know, a f future podcasts like more more in because this is this was quite broad. Um, but we can dive into like just certain certain topics and, you know, talk about those. So I'd be keen to have you back on in the future um, if you'd like. Yeah, for sure. I love that. Yeah. Honored to be here, man. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Really loved it. So, um, yeah, now we'll, we'll wrap it up now. Um, thank you guys for, for listening. And if you, if you like it, share it, like and subscribe. And um, leave a comment below if, if you feel like something resonated with you. And, um, yeah, keep the conversation going. I think that's important. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Right, Thanks, guys. Bill. Thanks, Bill. All right, see you guys. See you, boys. Latest. Cheers.